Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sophia, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of S.B. Divya's book, Machinehood and the Intersection of AI and Ethics, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us S.B. Divya for the launch of her book, Machinehood, and a discussion with Malka Older on the intersection of AI and ethics. S.B. Divya is the Hugo and Nebula nominated author of Runtime and co-editor of Escape Pod with Murr Lafferty. She holds degrees in computational neuroscience and signal processing, and she worked for 20 years as an electrical engineer before becoming an author. Her short stories have been published in various magazines, including Analog, Uncanny, and Tor. Her collection, Contingency Plans for the Apocalypse and Other Situations, is out now from Hachette, India. Machinehood is her debut novel from Saga Press. Find out more about her at sbdivia.com or on Twitter as Divya's Tweets. Joining SB in conversation is Malka Older. Malka Older is a writer, aid worker, and sociologist. Her science fiction political thriller, Infomocracy, was named one of the best books of 2016 by Kirkus, Book Riot, and The Washington Post. She is the creator of the serial Ninth Step Station, currently running on Serial Box, and her short story collection, And Other Disasters, came out in November 2019. She is a faculty associate at Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation in Society, and her opinions can be found in the New York Times, The Nation, and Foreign Policy, among other places. So, without further ado, please welcome S.B. Divya and Malka Older to the stage. Thank you so much, Sophie. It's really great to be here. And Divya, it's so wonderful to see you. And I'm so excited to talk about Machinehood because I loved this book so much. Um, it was just such a fantastic combination of really great and exciting new ideas, uh, fantastic world building about what our societies might look like in uh, 60 years and also a terrific story with a lot of action and um, excitement to tie all of that together and great characters. I really loved your characters. Um, they're so rich and there's so much uh, difference in the ways that they approach life and family and machinehood um, and all of the issues. So thank you for the book. It's really wonderful. And I think we have a lot to talk about in some of those issues that, that come up. And one place that I wanted to start uh, with the book, one thing that that um, struck me early on in it is the approach to the way that you talk about privacy. And that is a huge issue for all of us right now in how we deal with big data and machine learning in our own lives. Um, but the, the, the world that you describe in your book has a very different um, approach to privacy, a very different sense of it. And so maybe you could start talking a little bit about that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, first off, uh, thanks everyone for joining us and Strand for hosting and you Malka so much for joining me in this conversation. Um, as you know, I've been wanting to have a chat with you for a very long time. So this is a pleasure. Um, privacy in Machinehood, which is uh, takes place in 2095, has a very different feel from today's but it's also an extension of what I see happening today, which is the general erosion of privacy in exchange for services, in exchange for data, in exchange for open communication with our friends and family. And so I had kind of taken two um, ideas in terms of technology. One is the drone and the other is the ubiquitousness of cameras in everybody's hands and mash those together to create these microscopic drone swarms that are just everywhere, especially in public spaces, but even 
in a lot of people's homes. And it means that people are always on, someone can always be watching you, especially on the public streams. And yet, you know, the people of the future are not super freaked out by this because this is their daily life. They're used to being in the eyes of the public all the time. The flip side is when you have that much to watch, and I feel like we're already there with, you know, social media, there is way more content than any one human being can possibly keep track of. So a lot of it just gets lost. So it's a weird kind of privacy and yet not because you have the potential for anonymity if you're not well known. But if you are well known, of course, you're gonna be on camera all the time. And, um, and the benefit of it is you actually get paid for it if people like what they see in your life. So unlike today where it's a little bit harder to monetize your basic um, social media stream and really all you're getting back for it is the platform, in this future, you can get tips from anybody at any time depending on what you do just in your work, how you interact with your children or with other people on a cafe. And so um, so I had a lot of fun with that, especially in the context of, you know, this sort of intrigue and thriller plot where typically that relies on secrecy. And it's like, how do you conduct, you know, espionage if there's cameras everywhere all the time? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it really contributes to the plot in that way. But I also found really interesting how much it kind of skews all kinds of jobs and the way people interact. And, you know, so so the the, the point of view character that we start out with, uh, Welga, who she's, she's kind of a bodyguard, but being a bodyguard isn't actually that much about protecting someone as it is about looking good and making sure that all the people involved in this sort of whole relationship, this ecosystem of uh, attacks and protests and defense, looks good. Yeah, that kind of ties into the always being on camera, right? Um, if you know that uh, you're being recorded at any given time, you're going to make more of an effort to uh, to try to look good. And life itself becomes performative. The two things just integrate. And, um, you know, I, again, kind of, this is just like taking what we have today and extrapolating it and um, and enhancing it and making it an even wider phenomenon of the selfies, the influencer spaces, you know, people are a lot more conscious about how they look and how they present themselves in their lives to the rest of the world because they're doing it so often. Um, and so I kind of uh, ran with that same thing with, uh, with Machine Hood where, yeah, what if, what if you are, you have to be performative all the time, and then what happens in terms of um, things like protests, which were a lot on my mind when I was writing this in 2017 and 2018 for you know a plethora of political reasons. And I was like, what if you could get you know, tips and money for um, the quality of your protest, mm -hmm. right? And at that point, you can start protesting a whole lot more because it becomes a vocation. This is something you can do professionally for a living, which is to go out and um, try to right society's wrongs and turn it into a big publicity stunt. Yeah, that I mean, I found that really interesting, just the, just these massive shifts that came about from from uh, this difference in how people relate to, to privacy and, and public. Um, and at the same time, Welga really doesn't want privacy. She doesn't see the value of it in, in it. And what she does see the value of is being connected to her family and her friends almost constantly. And she actually hates it when she's in a place where she doesn't have connection. Yeah, I find that true sometimes for myself. Um, coming from the immigrant background, uh, it, you know, it's really hard to leave your family behind on the other side of the world. And I came to the US when I was five and we were sending, you know, the blue aerogram letters back and forth. And it was very hard to, to talk to family back home on the phone. And, you know, fast forward 20 years and like all my friends are Skyping their families back in India. You know, today you've got so many choices. You can talk to people all the time because it doesn't cost you any money anymore, right? We're not paying uh, by the minute for long distance calls. <laughs> um, and the internet is basically something you're getting almost infinite bandwidth for a fixed amount of money. So it's become 
a an abundant resource and it's possible to stay so much more involved in each other's lives than it used to be so why wouldn't we you know if we could always have in our visual field little windows into the lives of our loved ones why wouldn't we want to keep an eye on them at all times and see what was going on as much as possible to feel like we are with them even when we're not physically with them yeah, I think a lot of us are feeling that a lot right now. Yeah. Um, and and something else that I really appreciated about your book was the the degree of family connection that your characters have, and and you know, sort of adult family because we're used to seeing families described in terms of kids and and young adult books, but we see it much less in terms of how adult families relate to each other, adult siblings with their older parents and their in-laws. And and I really appreciated having that sense of these people's, you know, real lives and their family connections still being important to them. Yeah, I missed that in a lot of science fiction. Like there's so many examples of found families that people love, especially in um, space operas and adventures and you know even epic fantasy. But you hardly ever hear about people's parents mm -hmm. and uncles, grandparents, siblings. And uh, for me, like family is a huge part of my life and it would be strange to tell my story without involving all those pieces. And I think it, I don't know, I, th I think it adds a nice dimension and I, I would love to see more, um, more genre fiction kind of really take those relationships into account and play with them. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, when you are looking at questions of how people connect and how people have privacy or don't, I mean, that's looking at how that works on people's families is really important. So I, you know, it was it was both nice to see and it was a really lovely way of, of showing how some of these changes uh, interact with society. So yeah, I thought it was great. And, and there is also, I mean, maybe not found family, but there's, there are a lot of friend relationships that are, that are almost that family level, um, like Welga's apprentice that she begins to get close to through the book. And so th there are a lot of, of different relationships um, involved, even people who are something that also happens today, people who are only known virtually who suddenly become in person, even <laughs> refugees in someone's house. Uh, right. <laughs> and and just the way those things play out um, had a lot of a lot of realism in you know both the warmth and the tensions. Yeah, I like um, I really like focusing on that element. Any anyone in the audience who has read Runtime knows that uh, family was like a really critical part of that story too, and it tends to show up in a lot of my fiction. Again, I think because it's important to me, so it's hard for me to tell a story that ignores that aspect of someone's lives because I think whether you have a good relationship or a bad relationship with you know any particular family member it still influences how you move through your life and the decisions and choices you make and that's a big part of any narrative um but i think i don't know like american culture is so individualist and so they like that like the lone hero <laughs> and they often uh as my as my child po points out they often like orphan people just so they don't oh, have to oh. deal with their families anymore, which is kind of tragic, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so why not bring in, you know, family ties as an additional element of, of drama? Yeah, I, I find it really interesting how many kids books like orphan the kids and like they do realize it's the parents who are reading these books to the kids <laughs> or the at minimum buying the books, like show a little respect. Um, <laughs> But uh, I also wanted to talk about some of the other relationships, less traditional relationships in your book, because a lot of the book is about relationships between humans and machines. And that there's there's this really wide variety that you talk about. Um, one of the kind of most normal kinds of jobs in this world is for people to almost babysit bots, right? Because it's machines that are doing most of the work, but they still need people. Um, and then you have a kind of flip to that, which is that people have a, like an, a, a built-in personal assistant that's a, a just very, very competent Siri, <laughs> we could say. Um, and so there's these two weird relationships of, you know, babysitting, but also kind of being cared for and, and, and then some, some other relationships that come up as the book goes on. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that, that sort of human machine interaction. 
Yeah, I really wanted to explore uh, what it might be like to interact with advanced machine intelligence. Um, I'm going to shy away from AI in the sense, in the usual science fictional sense of like mm. a conscious, you know, self-aware robot, but more in the sense of today's AI just made a lot more complex and capable. And, um, and I wanted to kind of examine what our day-to-day -day interaction might be like with that in the future. Um, and so on the one hand, I had the, the what I call the agent, who's basically like a, a really hyper-competent personal assistant that's always with you, not just keeping track of your appointments, but your medication, your family's birthdays, you know, um, maybe even giving you tips on what to wear or how to style your hair and um, generally like advising and also um, just kind of outsourcing all the little things that we tend to drop on a daily basis because we are human and we're forgetful. And um, and on the other side, so, so that's a thing that's like obviously very helpful in making you more competent, more productive in getting you through your life in a way that hopefully makes you happier. On the flip side, machinehood kind of takes our current concerns about the labor conflict between humans and automation and carries that further forward to, well, when we do get fairly competent robots that can navigate the streets, that can do a lot more complex tasks than they can today, and they are widespread, what is left for people to do? Like, that's the big question, right? What are the jobs of the future going to be? And um, and so I was trying to envision, you know, what some of those uh, could plausibly be. And there are people in the book who reflect the view that it's derogatory to just, you know, walk with a robot somewhere to, to kind of give that human touch. But at the same time, there are other people who totally enjoy that kind of work, right? Like they're mm -hmm. fine with it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I wanted to present those two sides because I could imagine a lot of people of today being like, well, that's it. Like, I'm just gonna, you know, walk into a house with a care bot and it's gonna take care of the elderly person or the sick person. And I'm just gonna hang out and chat with them while it, it does all the work. Um, but that's fine, right? Because I think human beings do need that human interaction and we need occupation. Like this mm -hmm. is one of the big struggles with universal basic income and stuff is that people want to feel like their lives have meaning, purpose and value. And a lot of that is externally driven. So this gives you a purpose. You're getting paid to do this. And you know, you feel like you have some value because um, the robot can't do the chit chat, right? Mm -hmm. Not as well as the human can. And so I kind of try to work in ways with, um, with that and also in terms of the sort of virtualized work that a lot of people do, this like everything is gig economy, um, everything is contractual, there's no more big corporations. So I really played around with the socioeconomics of the future. And that's one way I can see us going, especially as we outsource more and more labor to um, to machines and to intelligent software. And so putting those two things together, it's like, yes, um, as with most tools, as with these computers that we're all talking on, uh, they're going to help us, but they are certainly going to also change the face of how people work and the types of work that is valued by society and that gets paid for. Yeah, um, and and I think it it works really well in in the book, and you're able to show just a really wide range of what those look like. Uh, and something else that that I thought was um, a little bit unusual in science fiction books that I really appreciated uh, was that this this future has a future. So the people who are in this world are like thinking, oh, someday we're going to get to the, the actual strong sentient AI and that's going to change everything, but we don't know how. And they, they, you know, they feel very much the way, the way we do, the way everyone does, that they are in a present time that's moving towards something else that they don't know what it'll be. And I think that's often missing from a lot of books that, you know, think they're writing about the future and that's it. It's done. So there, there, is, <laughs> there is really a sense in this book that um, that there's a lot of uncertainty, that there's a lot of change going on, there's a lot of progress, and and there's something just around the corner, but but they don't know what it is. 
I kind of feel like um, we've been inhabiting that world for maybe even the past two centuries. Um, you can probably speak to this too, uh, but especially, you know, the 20th century, right? With the, all of the industrial revolution that happened a hundred years ago and the massive changes from agrarian society to, um, to the industrialized society and then to now to the, you know, the digitized society, the information age that's coming up. And I do, um, I do subscribe somewhat to Kurzweil's theory of this like ex exponential acceleration of technological progress and watching human beings trying to keep up with that um, is like a perpetual existential crisis, right? You're just moving from, I just got used to, you know, my phone, my smartphones, but 10 years before, like we had all just got used to having cell phones and 10 years before that, it was like, what is this internet thing, you know, and what is the dot com? And so change is like this, this perennial facet. I don't know like how far you would have to go back in society in, in our history of the world to find a period where people felt like there was stability for, you know, most of their foreseeable lives, that nothing much was going to change. But like I said, at least going back one or two centuries, I feel like, yeah, between, you know, the steam engine, electricity, factories, cars, computers, like smart devices, and now um, biotech. It's like that was the big revolution that happens between the present and when machinehood takes place is um, taking biotechnology and genetic engineering and applying the principles of the personal computer to that. So what if you could personalize and do a lot of that stuff? at home, how's that going to change and revolutionize the social landscape? So yeah, I, I, I can't imagine a future in which things are suddenly stable again. I feel like if anything, it's going to just become increasingly rapid and unstable. And the best way for us to keep up with it is to continue enhancing our own intelligence with all these smart devices that make us smarter. Yeah, I and mean, that's we haven't even talked about the other part of of this future world, which is that people are taking all these these biotechnology, these pills um, to make themselves smarter and stronger and faster and heal faster and also deal with um, new diseases that have been d designed by people on purpose or uh, that come up naturally and and so they have this you know it's 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 almost an arms race between the machines and the biotechnology uh, applied to humans. Yeah, it definitely it definitely is. That was that was the direction I took this in was um, was this sort of escalating tension and us trying to keep up with the machines and the machines leapfrogging us. And um, we're not quite there yet. And I don't know if the tabletop genetics and biotech is really going to happen. I threw that in there because I thought it was a fun science fictional concept and it was a way to kind of give myself a path into this particular future. Mm -hmm. um, it was really weird, the pandemic aspect of this story, um, because I wrote all of it before the actual pandemic happened. And yet uh, I was editing a lot of it last year during the pandemic. And there were pieces of the book where I was reading it and I was like, Oh yeah, that that's a little too close to home right mm -hmm. now. Um, I'm sure you know as the peril of anyone who writes near future science fiction. <laughs> it's, experience. it's not a comfortable feeling. It's not like we don't want to predict uh, mm -hmm. the the bad things that that can happen, but at the same time, you know, you can you can see them coming potentially, right? Um, yeah. The plus side is in machine head, people get to respond a lot faster to um, pathogens and uh, both viruses, bacteria, and whether it's hacked and engineered or just a natural um, mutations and evolutions, people are basically taking antidotes to these things daily and other people throughout the world are spending the bulk of their time keeping up with what's going on and designing these antidotes and spreading the designs to people. And um, and the reason it works is because unlike today, where everything is hyper centralized in terms of manufacturing vaccines and pharmaceuticals, in the world of machinehood, everything is completely distributed, and you have devices in every home that can manufacture. Um, that was that was another fun idea I had, kind of taking three uh, D printing and you know 
letting my mm -hmm. imagination run wild with that. Like what else could we plausibly print at home? Mm -hmm. And instead of having centralized, what if we decentralized manufacturing, right? Like mm -hmm. we had the industrial revolution, we centralized everything because it used to be everyone just did everything at home or like you had your local craftsperson um, and then it became consolidated for efficiency. But I think it's just as efficient with the right technology to decentralize everything again. And that puts power back into the hands of the individuals, both in terms of R&D, but also um, in terms of what they choose to consume. Um, so I was I, I had another question, but I just realized that your your is it a shawl or a jacket is printed with HTML tags? Yes, it is, <laughs> and I love it. Uh, <laughs> I will plug the uh, the brand. This is Spaha Apparel, and everything they have is subtly geeky. Some of it's less subtle than others. But <laughs> I, I have a package on the way. Um, from them. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. But that's 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 a great one. Um, so I was I was. Going to go on to um, so you have this situation with the the machines and the biotech, and uh, then Welga's world gets dr dramatically changed with this manifesto from a group that calls itself Machinehood about um, rights for machines and saying that machines anything that's sentient should have the same rights, whether it's mechanical or biological, and you know it's. In in our world, in that world, it's there's there's a lot of confusion over this. What does it mean? Because you have in this world, you have bots, just like we have, you know, washing machines, um, and you have these these sort of very low intelligence kind of bots. Are they included? And then you have these personal agents, and then you have this this mystery of, you know, is there the strong AI that everyone keeps looking for? Um, so, but I wanted to ask, you know, how how do you feel about this idea of of machine rights? What would that look like? Does it make any sense at all? Yeah, it's funny. I um, I wrote the manifesto inspired by a few other actual manifestos. I read, um, obviously, the, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. I read, uh, the, I read the Unabomber Manifesto. <laughs> Not the entire thing. It's 35,000 words. I was like, good God, this guy <laughs> likes to write a lot. On his hands. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I skimmed it to just to kind of get the, the gist of like how manifestos are written and what people care about when they write these things. Cause, um, cause he was a smart guy, even if he was a terrible person. Mm. Um, and then I looked at the UN Declaration of Rights uh to kind of model like what are these people agitating for in terms of machinehood or personhood for intelligent machines and i matched it all up and i kind of talked myself into a lot of it as i was writing it though i don't necessarily 100 percent subscribe to everything that's in there um but i do think that this is a really the the bigger question in my mind is not so much do machines deserve legal personhood or some sort of uh, recognition of personhood? But how do we know when we get there? Like, mm. where are the lines? Like, we try to draw very, very hard, distinct lines right now between things that are living, things that are non-living, humans versus animals, even though we are also animals, we kind of put mm. ourselves in a separate mm. category, animate objects, inanimate objects. like. I do, uh, one of the, the philosophies I tend to interrogate in machinehood that I do feel reasonably strongly about personally is this tendency for a lot of Western thought, especially, but thought in general to want to be very binary about the way we categorize things. And luckily I see us uh, moving at least in certain segments of society to looking at things on a spectrum, right? Even things like gender that's become a spectrum, sexuality has become a spectrum, uh, race and ethnicity, um, even religion, if you really think about it, uh, all of these things are, are actually not binary at the end of the day. And so when it comes to us versus AIs or animals versus people, I think, that is also going to end up being on a spectrum. Um, we've seen, like we've seen, like you said, with, you know, you've got your sensing washing machines and dishwashers and microwaves and, and, and then you've got your Roombas and then you've got, you know, your Boston Dynamics uh, robots. And then you have Siri and Alexa and Google. 
And so we're getting more sophisticated as time goes on and we're gonna get way more sophisticated in the next few decades. And eventually these pieces are gonna start coming together, right? So the Boston Dynamics dancing robot will also be able to have a reasonable conversation with you. And at that point, like the average person, you can imagine children, but I think even most adults would start to imbue these machines with some sort of personality, whether they like it or not, because they're mm -hmm. gonna start recognizing. It. Like we're already starting to do it with our uh, voice assistants. And you know, sometimes even when we yell at our devices, which I think mm -hmm. everyone's been doing <laughs> for several decades who owns a computer. So how do we, you know, I, I think we're gonna lose those distinctions and those lines are gonna be very, very blurry. And in terms of legalities, it starts getting super thorny, super fast. Mm. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with, uh, with some legal people on Clubhouse, I'm gonna shout out to Clubhouse, um, this past weekend on AI ethics and warfare. And you know, I was asking this person who had question and they're like, well, you know, legally you need to have assets. How do you give a robot assets? And um, the conversation diverted before I could get back to the point, but I was like, well, isn't the robot its own asset? Just like our bodies mm -hmm. are, it's like the one thing that we're all supposed to own short of slavery is ourselves and our bodies. So the robot at the very least is its own asset. I mean, and it's a costly asset uh, regardless of who developed and built it. So mm -hmm. I think we there's probably going to be some ways that we're going to have to legally navigate these things and um and I with the manifesto I kind of really wanted to get people asking these kinds of questions like yes we're not there yet but when the day comes that your robot dog really really acts like a dog and you really love it and someone runs over it with a car like you can be sad. And mm. I think it's your right to be sad at that point as a human mm. being. And um, and if somebody else decides to smash it in with a baseball bat, like if they did that to your real dog, that would be a crime. Mm. So, and if they did that to your personal property, that would be a different crime. Mm. But your emotional attachment to the dog, right? gives you know a certain judicial weight to it and your emotional attachment to the robot dog if it's the same i think should have that same judicial weight attached to it so this is the kind of like mm. these are the kind of complex things um i think we are we are likely to actually face whether or not we recognize the robot dog as being sentient and deserving of any sort of individual rights may be irrelevant uh, when it comes to legislation and how we interact with these devices in our lives over the next century. That's a really, that's a fascinating perspective that I hadn't even thought of. And um, because, you know, I keep stumbling over, does the machine want rights? Can it, can it understand rights as opposed to, you know, how our relationship to the machine and what is made necessary legally and societally by that? Um, and I think, you know, also, I mean, one of the the, the main kind of uh, things in this manifesto is that uh, these these machines shouldn't be hurt or destroyed, right? Right. And that's actually a good principle to have for stuff, whether it's animate or inanimate. I mean, you know, we, we you definitely shouldn't go and hurt a, a random dog, but you also shouldn't go and pollute a random river or chop right. down a random tree or, you know, destroy a, a rock for no reason. Um, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's, I think there's, there's a certain like general <laughs> principle there that maybe, maybe sentience isn't actually the right question to be asking at all. Yeah. Speaking of rivers, there's a river in New Zealand, the um, Wanganui that has legal personhood and rights. Um, mostly brought on by the, the Maori that um, see that river as a, a sacred person. And they were tired of it being dammed up and polluted <laughs> and oh. everything else. And, uh, and so they, um, they pushed for this legislation and they got it. And so it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how these kinds of things play out. I think there might be something like that is happening um, with maybe a body of water in India as well. And so, yeah, I mean, if we, 
again, like there's a lot that the devil's in the details as usual, right? In terms of how we legislate these things and how we um, adjudicate them. But, uh, but I think it is worth kind of broadening our scope beyond human life to kind of look at the value of uh, everything around us because we interact with our environment. We're not as separate from it as we might think. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to bring up something else that, that you actually mentioned just a little bit, which is religion, because uh, again, this is something that you almost never see in science fiction books is religion. And your book has quite a bit and it has religions that are pretty much, you know, the same as, as, as what they are now that haven't changed too much. And then there are a couple of religions that have, change dramatically, or maybe we should better say offshoots of religions that are sort of newish um, things or versions. And it was great to see that really uh, impact how, how some of the characters behaved in different ways and be less important for other characters. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to see how you thought about putting that into the book. I think it came up because I don't see religion going away. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in the next 75 years, like it's it's such an integral part of uh, so many people's lives, maybe not in their day to day lives, but again, in terms of the choices they make and how they navigate their relationships, their value sets, all of that. And um, and so and then, of course, like my with uh, Welga, you know, of the two main characters, I have Welga and I have Nithya. Nithya is uh, South Indian and she's Hindu. Walga is, you know, mixed race, but um, her father is Mexican American, and so they're fairly Catholic, uh, or at least she comes from that family background. Like Walga herself represents the atheist point of view, but mm -hmm. her brother uh, Luis is is pretty Catholic, mm -hmm. and so um, it was interesting just to kind of again like see, you know, to explore the relationship tensions between them, and and for the people who haven't read the book in the audience, which is possibly most of them since it hasn't come out yet. Um, Walga's <laughs> brother, uh, Luis, is married to Nithya. So this is how the 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 two main characters are, you know, sisters-in-law. And so one of the things I've um, I've come across just generally in life, especially in Southern California, is uh, what we commonly call like a mixed marriage, right? People from two different cultures, um, getting together and making a life together. And my own is one of these. And while my spouse and I are not terribly religious, um, we know people who are, and they sometimes come from two different religions and like watching them navigate that has always uh, been really interesting to me because everyone always, you know, any couple is navigating two different backgrounds, no matter how disparate mm -hmm. or how similar, like you are different people, you're gonna disagree about stuff. But religion is one of these things that for some people, you know, they hold very, very strongly to and it's a huge part of their identity. And then it's like, how do you deal with the fact that um, you're bringing these two very different ideas to the table, especially about certain issues and how do you navigate that? And you're right, you see this a lot more probably in like, literary fiction or romance i don't actually i don't know if romance really gets into religion not, not very too much, much either no. but but like but, but people seem to think it's going to be gone in the future or they invent a whole new one and it's it's disconnected to to what we believe today well i think a lot of science fiction authors um including myself are atheists and so we just want to kind of ignore the messy stuff about religion because we mm -hmm. don't necessarily subscribe to it we don't always find it comfortable to talk about mm -hmm. um but i have so many friends and family who are very religious and like and they're important to me so i don't i'm not going to dismiss them and i certainly uh, don't want to erase them from the futures that i that I create. <laughs> so I try to at least be respectful and kind of represent at least a few different religions, right? And not not create like a, a false new dogma that suddenly the whole world is <laughs> mono religious. Mono any monoculture, I don't I don't see that happening yeah. uh, anytime in the near future either. <laughs> yeah. And we're we're almost um at the time to start taking questions. But I also just wanted to say how much I appreciated having these two 
the two main characters are these two women who are really, really different. And neither of them, I almost don't want to describe them because like, I don't want to do this shorthand that makes them sound like, like flat characters, but, and they're not, they're, they're really both very rich and, and don't conform to the automatic stereotypes, but they, they do give us these really different perspectives because Welga, uh, she was a soldier and she, she really liked being a soldier. And then she had a, a, a an event that took her out of that. And then she took on this bodyguarding and she really likes doing that. She doesn't, uh, really want to move on. Um, she also loves cooking though. And that's, that's like the thing that she's, that she's looking forward to move on to is like slow food movement. Um, so she's got all this, all these, these, these different things, but she likes, she really likes fighting and she really likes being in shape and using her body and, um, and food. Everyone likes food, I think. But, and then you have Nitya on the other hand, who's, um, you know, she's, she's got a family, she's got a kid, she's got a lot of pressures uh, with her job. She's just in a very, very different situation. Um, and she's also out there doing the things that she needs to do, you know, taking the time out of her job to help Welga with whatever expertise she can and uh, reaching out and offering asylum really to one of her her work colleagues who becomes a friend, and so you just have these these two stories that are are very very different in feeling um, when you're reading from the different perspectives. Yeah, I was uh, I was commenting to someone else that Welga is my wish fulfillment character because I am uh, terrible at physical stuff, <laughs> and uh, I am highly avoidant of confrontation. And I was like, I wish sometimes that I were more of a fighter or better mm. at it. Um, Whereas Nithya is more, a little, a lot more of me, right? She's mm -hmm. the, she's the intellectual. She uses her brain more. She's more focused on her personal life and her family. Whereas Walga is kind of looking at the broader society. She wants to protect not just her family but everybody. She wants to make you know a big impact and difference on the world. So um, yeah, I, I kind of wish I was more like uh a kick-ass <laughs> soldier because i have none of that in me um and uh and nithya really kind of represents yeah my my reality you know she's in chennai and not in the u.s but uh outside of that um probably have a lot more in common with her <laughs> well they're both really really fun to read and and have really interesting stories so um i hope everyone will get a copy of the book right away and read it. And in the meantime, we're going to take some questions. So uh, please feel free to put questions into the question box. Uh, I guess you can put them in the chat too, but if you put them right into the question box, that'll be easier. It's the little thing that says, ask a question at the bottom of the screen. Um, and so we have the first one, which is, is there anything that you read for inspiration? Are there any books that influenced machinehood? The things that, um, let's see. Before I wrote Machine Hood, I did a bunch of research and um, Michio Kakutani had a book on, I think the next 50 years and kind of like the upcoming uh, frontiers in various aspects of science and technology. That was very much an inspiration uh, along with just the reading I do generally um, with the Science X newsletter, with MIT Technology Review and just kind of trying to keep abreast with the latest going on. Um, that a lot of that inspired the technological parts of what I developed for Machine Hood. I was trying to keep it as realistic as possible. So there's not like, there's no like super shiny G whiz new thing that you've never heard of before. Like mm -hmm. everything in Machine Hood is happening somewhere in a lab today, maybe at very, very rudimentary levels and very crude levels. Um, but it's sort of like, you know, the adding machines of, of Babbage, right? Like eventually you get from there to something a lot more complex and widespread and consumer level. Um, for the for the economics, I don't think there were any specific books I drew from, though I did kind of study labor conflicts of the 1920s and kind of the history a little bit of the industrial revolution and try to draw some parallels between that and our world and the world of a hundred years from now. In terms of, I don't know if they're asking um, like fiction books, but Malka's book, Infomocracy, <laughs> um, was definitely uh, one of the ones I always point people to. I'm like, if you liked Infomocracy, you probably will like my book too, because um, 
because I loved the ideas in infomarkacy. I love the way she's looking at, you know, how information is used and disseminated, uh, decentralized, in her case, socio-political system, in my case, more of a socio-economic system. Um, and then the other book, which I read shortly after I drafted, I had finished the first draft of Machine Hood, I picked up Autonomous because I think it came out right around then mm -hmm. by Annalie Newitz. And um, and I was really scared because I, I started reading Autonomous. At, like I got a third of the way through <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, Annalie already wrote my book. Like yeah. I am toast, no one's gonna <laughs> buy this because their book has a pharmaceutical plot and an AI subplot. And then I, I kept I kept reading because it was really good. And I got to the end, I'm like, okay, phew, like it's Annalie's A different. plot is my B plot. And <laughs> <my story. laughs> plus their book takes place about 50 years after mine and the AI is a little bit more advanced and you know the economics are, are considerably different. Um, so I was like, okay, phew, like I'm still saying things in machine hood that are different. But I would say that you know, it's a great way to kind of extend the conversation. Like mm -hmm. I would actually suggest if you haven't read Autonomous, read Machine Head first, because it's mm -hmm. almost like a prequel and then go and read Autonomous because it's carrying forward a lot of the same questions. Um, but it's like I said, 50 years later and technology has actually, not that we planned it, but you know, <laughs> their technology is further along than mine. Um, and then otherwise I would say, no, it's mostly like, in conversation with uh, pop culture depictions of AI, which really, really uh, bother me a lot of times. And I really wanted to give a more grounded, realistic depiction of where I think AI and robotics could be headed over this next century, as opposed to the usual like Terminator or, you know, Westworld or whatever um, thrilling, chilling thing Hollywood comes up with uh -huh, uh -huh. in terms of AI or the opposite, right? Like the big hero sixes and stuff that are like the really sweet robots or the iron giant, but all of them are a lot smarter and more capable and self-aware than I think we're probably going to get to in the next 50 to a hundred years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and gender. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so there's another question before we start off on that rabbit hole, which I'm sure would take us to a lot of interesting places. Um, is there a second book in the world of machinehood and what would you write next? There is not yet a second book in the world of machinehood, but I could certainly see myself setting a lot more stories in that world. I think there's a richness to explore and I don't know if I would continue Welga's story specifically. I think her character arc and development are pretty well closed by the end of this book. It stands alone in that respect. Mm -hmm. But I think there are repercussions to what happens in Machine Hood that could absolutely be explored further. And there's a lot of other types of people mm -hmm. in, in our world, which is not that far off from the world of Machine Hood, whose stories I would love to, to tell mm -hmm. and explore. And then um, in terms of uh, what I actually have written, uh, somehow during the pandemic, I found a great escape in writing far future stuff with no pandemics and plagues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so I've written a, a very different novel with uh, post-humans and space travel and all kinds of fun stuff. And it is, uh, its fate is still hanging in the balance, but we'll see what comes of it. That sounds exciting. That sounds really cool. And I, I had a similar, I was all in the fantasy world. So it was just <laughs> all the universe um, for the whole past year. So, and another question, which is, what is your writing process like? Is there a routine that works best for you in writing? My writing process has kind of evolved along with my writing career over the past several years. Um, when I started, I was mostly doing a little bit every night and then um, it has snowballed and started taking over more and more of my life. And uh, so I actually get to carve out time during the day and write now. And um, so I'll do a chunk during the day while my, uh, my child's at school. And then I'll do another chunk at night after everyone else in the house has gone to bed because I'm a night owl and nighttime is my happy place. And that's when I get like my best writing done quite often. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, <there it> <laughs> um, and then we, we have, I think time for, for this other question, which is um, 
You don't think that sentient robots will be developed soon in the next 25 years? What are the barriers and how will we know when they are sentient? That is exactly the barrier, actually, is how <laughs> we know when they're sentient, because mm -hmm. we uh, do not have a very solid handle on, on how we are sentient, or what mm -hmm. it really means, what is consciousness, how do we codify it, and how do we turn it into a system that we can actually build and reproduce. And I think until we cross that barrier, mm -hmm. um, we're not going to have necessarily sentient in the way that we think robots or AIs. I do think, however, that we're going to have AIs that are very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that the average person is not necessarily going to be able to tell the difference, right? But mm -hmm. somebody built them and whoever built them didn't put in sentience as mm -hmm. a module in the code or, you know, a block in the chip. And so from that standpoint, I think the designers will be reluctant to call it sentient, the same reason that I'm reluctant to call today's machine learning software AI. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so that really is the question. It's like, how will we know? And that's, uh, that's actually a big part of what I explore um, in this novel. Yeah. So thanks right. for that great <laughs> last question. <laughs> An excellent question to end on. Um, thank you, um, SB Divya, and thank you, Malka Older, for joining us tonight. This is super interesting. I know very little about AI and sort of, you know, the ethics that come behind that. So this was very enlightening for me. So it was a treat. Um, for our wonderful audience, thank you for joining us as well. Um, is there anything our um, guests would like to say to our audience before we sign off for the night? Um, Read <laughs> yeah, thanks. I want to thank Malka for all the, the awesome questions and conversation. And thank you, Sophia and uh, The Strand for having me. This was wonderful. And uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for, for showing up on your precious Monday evening or afternoon or possibly morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, if our wonderful audience hasn't already bought a copy of Machine Hood, you can. It is that purchase button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, um, our wonderful audience and our wonderful guests for joining us again tonight. Everyone stay safe out there. Wear your masks, lice all your hands. Don't touch anything you're not supposed to. Um, have a good rest of your night and we'll see you at another event in the far future or the near future. <laughs> good night, everyone.